Chapter 137 of Tales of Laughter. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dale Grothman. Tales of Laughter by Nora Archibald Smith and Kate Douglas Wiggin. Chapter 137 The Story of Little Black Mingo by Helen Bannerman. Once upon a time there was a little black girl, and her name was Little Black Mingo. She had no father and mother, so she had to live with a horrid cross old woman called Black Nogi, who used to scold her every day, and sometimes beat her with a stick, even though she had done nothing naughty. One day Black Nogi called her and said, Take this chatty down to the river and fill it with water, and come back as fast as you can. Quick now! So little black Mingo took the chatty and ran down to the river as fast as she could, and began to fill it with water. When crack, bang, a horrible big mugger poked its nose up through the bottom of the chatty and said, Ha ha, little Mingo, I am going to eat you up. Little black Mingo did not say anything. She turned and ran away as fast as ever she could, and the mugger ran after her. But the broken chatty around his neck caught his paws, so he could not overtake her. But when she got back to Black Nogi and told her how the mugger had broken the chatty, Black Nogi was fearfully angry. "'You naughty girl,' she said. "'You have broken the chatty yourself. I have a good mind to beat you.' And if she had not been in such a hurry for the water, she would have beaten her. Then she went and fetched the great big chatty that the doby used to boil the clothes in. Take this, she said, and mind you don't break it, or I will beat you. But I can't carry it when it's full of water, said little black Mingo. You must go twice and bring it half full each time, said black Nogi. So little black Mingo took the doby's great big chatty and started again to go to the river. But first she went to a little bank above the river, and peeped up and down to see if she could see the old mugger anywhere. But she could not see him, for he was hiding under the very bank she was standing on, and though his tail stuck out of the water, she never saw him at all. She would like to have run home, but she was too much afraid that Black Nogi would beat her. So little Black Mingo crept down to the river and began filling the big chatty with water. And while she was filling it, the mugger came creeping softly behind her, and caught her by the leg, saying, Ah, little black Mingo, now I've got you. And little black Mingo said, Oh, please, don't eat me up, great big mugger. What will you give me if I don't eat you up, said the mugger. But little black Mingo was so poor she had nothing to give. So the mugger caught her in his great cool mouth, and swam away with her to an island in the middle of the river and set her down beside a huge pile of eggs. "'Those are my eggs,' he said. "'Tomorrow a little mugger will come out of each, and then we will have a great feast, and we will eat you up.' Then he waddled off to catch a fish for himself, and left little black Mingo alone beside the big pile of eggs. And little black Mingo sat down on a big stone, and hid her face in her hands, and cried bitterly because she couldn't swim, and she didn't know how to get away. Presently she heard a queer little squeaking noise that sounded like, Squeak! 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 Oh, little black Mingo, help me, or I shall be drowned. She got up and looked to see what was calling, and she saw a bush come floating down the river with something wriggling and scrambling about in it, and as it came near she saw that it was a mongoose that was in the bush. So she waded out as far as she could, and caught hold of the bush, and pulled it in, and the poor mongoose crawled up her arm to her shoulder, and she carried him to shore. When they got to shore the mongoose shook himself, and little black Mingo wrung out her petticoat, and so they both very soon got dry. The mongoose then began to poke around for something to eat, and very soon he found the great pile of mugger's eggs. "'Oh, joy!' said he. What's this? Those are the mugger's eggs, said little black Mingo. I'm not afraid of muggers, said the mongoose, and he sat down and began to crack the eggs and eat the little muggers as they came out. 
and he threw the shells into the water, so that the old mugger could not see that anyone had been eating them. But he was careless, and he left one eggshell on the edge, and he was hungry, and he ate so many that the pile got much smaller, and when the old mugger came back he saw at once that someone had been meddling with them. So he ran to little black Mingo, and said, How dare you eat my eggs? Indeed, indeed, I didn't, said little black Mingo. Then who could it have been, said the mugger, and he ran back to the eggs as fast as he could, and, sure enough, when he got back he found the mongoose had eaten a whole lot more. Then he said to himself, I must stay beside my eggs until they are hatched into little muggers, or the mongoose will eat them all. So he curled himself into a ring around the eggs and went to sleep. But while he was asleep the mongoose came to eat some more eggs, and ate as many as he wanted, and when the mugger woke this time, oh, what a rage he was in, for there were only six eggs left. He roared so loud that all the little muggers inside the shells gnashed their teeth and tried to roar too. Then he said, I know what I'll do. I'll fetch little black Mingo's big chatty and cover my eggs with that. Then the mongoose won't be able to get at them. So he swam across to the shore and fetched the doby's big chatty and covered the eggs with it. Now, you wicked little mongoose, come and eat my eggs if you can, he said and he went off quite proud and happy. By and by the mongoose came back, and he was terribly disappointed when he found the eggs were all covered with the big chatty. So he ran off to little black Mingo and asked her to help him, and little black Mingo came and took the big chatty off the eggs, and the mongoose ate them, every one. Now, he said, there will be no little muggers to make a feast for tomorrow. No, said little black Mingo. But the mugger will eat me all by myself, I'm afraid. No, he won't, said the mongoose, for we will sail away together in the big chatty before he comes back. So he climbed onto the edge of the chatty, and little black Mingo pushed the chatty out into the water, and then she clambered into it and paddled with her two hands as hard as she could, and the big chatty just sailed beautifully. So they got across safely, and little black Mingo filled the chatty half full of water and took it on her head, and they went up the bank together. When the mugger came back and found only empty eggshells, he was fearfully angry. He roared, and he raged, and he howled, and he yelled, till the whole island shook, and his tears ran down his cheeks and patted on the sand like rain. So he started to chase little black Mingo and the mongoose, and he swam across the river as fast as he could and when he was halfway across he saw them landing, and as he landed they hurried over the first ridge. So he raced after them, but they ran, and just before he caught them they got into the house and banged the door in his face. Then they shut all the windows, so he could not get in anywhere. All right, he said. You will have to come out sometime, and then I'll catch you both and eat you up so he hid behind the back of the house and waited. Now Black Nogi was just coming home from the bazaar with a tin of kerosene on her head and a box of matches in her hand, and when he saw her the mugger rushed out and gobbled her up, kerosene, tin, matches and all. When Black Nogi found herself in the mugger's insides she wanted to see where she was, so she felt for the matchbox and took out a match and lit it but the mugger's teeth had made holes in the kerosene tin, so that the flame of the match caught the kerosene, and bang! The kerosene exploded, and blew the old mugger and black nogi into little bits. At the fearful noise little black Mingo and the mongoose came running out, and there they found black nogi and the old mugger, all blown to bits. So little black Mingo and the mongoose got a nice little house for their very own and there they lived happily ever after. And little black Mingo got the mugger's head for her seat, and the mongoose got black Nogi's handkerchief for his, but he was so wee that he used to put it on the mugger's nose, and there they sat and had their tea every evening. End of chapter 137 of Tales of Laughter
Chapter 138 of Tales of Laughter. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dale Grothman. Tales of Laughter by Nora Archibald Smith and Kate Douglas Wiggin. Chapter 138 The Cock and the Crested Hen. There was once a cock who had a whole farmyard full of hens to look after and manage, and among them was a tiny little crested hen. She thought she was altogether too grand to be in the company with the other hens, for they looked so old and shabby. She wanted to go out and strut about all by herself so that people could see how fine she was and admire her pretty crest and beautiful plumage. So one day, when all the hens were strutting about on the dust heap and showing themselves off, and picking and clucking as they were wont to do, this desire seized her, and she began to cry. Cluck, 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 over the fence, cluck, 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 over the fence, and wanted to get away. The cock stretched his neck and shook his comb and feathers and cried, Go not there, and all the old hens cackled, Go, 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 go not there. But she set off for all of that, and was not a little proud when she got away and could go about pluming and showing herself off quite alone. Just then a hawk began to fly around in a circle above her, and all of a sudden he swooped down upon her. The cock, as he stood on the top of the dust heap, stretching his neck and peering first with one eye and then with the other, had long noticed him, and cried with all his might, Come, 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 come and help! Come, come, come and help! Till the people came running to see what was the matter. They frightened the hawk, so he let go the hen, and had to be satisfied with her tuft and her finest feathers, which he had plucked from her. And then, you may be sure, she lost no time in running home. She stretched her neck, and tripped along, crying, See, 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 see how I look! See, 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 see how I look! The cock came up to her, in his dignified way, drooping one of his wings, and said, Didn't I tell you? From that time the hen did not consider herself too good to be in the company of the old hens on the dust heap. End of chapter 138 The Cock and the Crested Hen Chapter 139 of Tales of Laughter This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Dale Grothman Chapter 139 of Tales of Laughter by Kate Douglas Wiggin and Nora Archibald Smith The Old Woman and the Fish There was once upon a time an old woman who lived in a miserable cottage on the brow of a hill overlooking the town. Her husband had been dead for many years, and her children were in service rounded about the parish so she felt rather lonely and dreary by herself, and otherwise she was not particularly well off either. But when it has been ordained that one shall live, one cannot think of one's funeral, and so one has to take the world as it is, and still be satisfied. That was about all the old woman could console herself with, but that the road up which she had to carry the pails from the well should be so heavy, and that the axe should have a blunt and rusty edge, so that it was only with greatest difficulty that she could cut the little firewood she had, and that the stuff she was weaving was not sufficient. All this grieved her greatly, and caused her to complain from time to time. One day, when she had pulled the bucket up from the well, she happened to find a small pike in the bucket, which did not at all displease her. "'Such a fish does not come into my pot every day,' she said and now she could have a really grand dish, she thought. But the fish that she had got this time was no fool, and it had the gift of speech that it had. Let me go, said the fish. The old woman began to stare, you might be sure. Such a fish she had never before seen in this world. Are you so much than other fish, then, she said, and too good to be eaten? Wise is he who does not eat all that he gets hold of, said the fish. Only let me go, and you shall not remain without reward for your trouble. 
I like a fish in a bucket better than all those frisking about free and frolicsome in the lakes, said the old woman. And that one can catch with one hand, one can also carry with one's mouth, she said. That may be, said the fish, but if you do as I tell you, you shall have three wishes. Wish in one fist and pour water in the other, and you'll soon see which you will get filled first, said the woman. Promises are well enough but keeping them is better, and I shan't believe much in you till I have got you in the pot, she said. You should mind that tongue of yours, said the fish, and listen to my words. Wish for three things, and then you'll see what will happen, he said. Well, the old woman knew well enough what she wanted to wish, and there might not be so much danger in trying how far the fish would keep his word, she thought. She then began thinking of the heavy hill up from the well. "'I would wish that the pails could go of themselves to the well and home again,' she said. "'So they shall,' said the fish. Then she thought of the axe and how blunt it was. "'I would wish that whatever I strike shall break right off,' she said. "'So it shall,' said the fish. Then she remembered that the stuff she was weaving was not long enough. I would wish that whatever I pull shall become long, she said. That it shall, said the fish. And now let me down into the well again. Yes, that she would, and all at once the pails begin to scramble up the hill. Dear me, did you ever see anything like it? The old woman became so glad and pleased that she slapped herself across the knees. Crack, crack, it sounded, and then both her legs fell off and she was left sitting on the top of the lid over the well. Now came a change. She began to cry and wail, and the tears started from her eyes, whereupon she started to blow her nose with her apron, and as she tugged at her nose, it grew so long, so long, that it was terrible to see. That is what she got for her wishes. Well, there she sat, and there she no doubt still sits, on the lid of the well, and if you want to know what it is like to have a long nose, you had better go there and ask her, for she can tell you all about it. She can. End of chapter 139 of Tales of Laughter The Old Woman and the Fish Chapter 140 of Tales of Laughter This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dale Grothman The Lad and the Fox There was once upon a time a little lad who was on his way to church, and when he came to a clearing in the forest he caught sight of a fox that was lying on top of a big stone so fast asleep that he did not know the lad had seen him. If I kill that fox, said the lad, taking a heavy stone in his fist, and sell the skin, I shall get money for it, and with that money I shall buy some rye, and that rye I shall sow in my father's cornfield at home. When the people who are on their way to church pass by my field of rye, they'll say, Oh, what splendid rye that lad has got! Then I shall say to them, I say, keep away from my rye. But they won't heed me. Then I shall shout at them, I say, keep away from my rye. But still they won't take any notice of me. Then I shall scream with all my might, keep away from my rye. And then they'll listen to me. But the lad screamed so loudly that the fox woke up and made off at once for the forest, so that the lad did not even get as much as a handful of his hair. No, it's always best to take what you can reach. For the undone deeds you should never screech, as the saying goes. The End of the Lad and the Fox Chapter 141 of Tales of Laughter This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dale Grothman Tales of Laughter by Nora Archibald Smith and Kate Douglas Wiggin Chapter 141 
the old woman and the tramp. There was once a tramp who went plodding his way through the forest. The distance between the houses was so great that he had little hope of finding shelter before the night set in. But all of a sudden he saw some lights between the trees. He then discovered a cottage where there was a fire burning on the hearth. How nice it would be to roast oneself before that fire, and to get a bite of something, he thought. So he dragged himself toward the cottage. Just then an old woman came toward him. Good evening, and well met, said the tramp. Good evening, said the woman. Where do you come from? South of the sun and east of the moon, said the tramp. And now I am on the way home again for I have been all over the world with the exception of this parish, he said. You must be a great traveler then, said the woman. What may be your business here? Oh, I want shelter for the night, he said. I thought as much, said the woman, but you may as well get away from here at once, for my husband is not home and my place is not an inn, she said. My good woman, said the tramp, you must not be so cross and hard-hearted, for we are both human beings and should help one another, as it is written. Help one another, said the woman. Help? Did you ever hear such a thing? Who will help me, do you think? I haven't a morsel in the house. No, you'll have to look for quarters elsewhere, she said. But the tramp was like the rest of his kind, and he did not consider himself beaten by the first rebuff although the old woman grumbled and complained as much as she could he was just as persistent as ever and went on begging and praying like a starved dog until at last she gave in and he got permission to lie on the floor for the night that was very kind he thought and he thanked her for it better on the floor without sleep than suffering cold in the forest deep he said for he was a merry fellow this tramp and always ready with a rhyme when he came into the room he could see that the woman was not so badly off as she had pretended, but she was a greedy and stingy woman of the worst sort, and always complaining and grumbling. He now made himself very agreeable, of course, and asked her in his most insinuating manner for something to eat. "'Where am I going to get it from?' said the woman. "'I haven't tasted a morsel myself the whole day.' But the tramp was a cunning fellow, he was. Poor old granny, you must be starving, he said. Well, well, I suppose I will have to ask you to have something with me then. Have something with you, said the woman. You don't look as if you could ask anybody to have anything. What have you got to offer one, I should like to know? He who far and wide does roam sees many things not known at home. And he who many things has seen has wits about him and senses keen said the tramp. Better dead than to lose one's head. Lend me a pot, Granny. The old woman now became very inquisitive, as you may have guessed, so she let him have a pot. He filled it with water and put it on the fire, and then he blew with all his might until the fire was burning fiercely all around it. Then he took a four-inch nail from his pocket, turned it three times in his hand, and put it into the pot. The woman stared with all her might. "'What's this going to be?' she asked. "'Nail broth,' said the tramp, and began to stir the water with a porridge stick. "'Nail broth?' asked the woman. "'Yes, nail broth,' said the tramp. The old woman had seen and heard a good deal in her time, but that anybody could make broth with a nail. Well, she had never heard the like before. That's something for poor people to know, she said, and I should like to learn how to make it. That which is not worth having will always go a-begging, said the tramp. But if she wanted to learn how to make it, she had only to watch him, he said, and went on stirring the broth. The old woman squatted on the ground, her hands clasping her knees, and her eyes following his hand as he stirred the broth. This generally makes good broth, he said but this time it will very likely be rather thin, for I have been making broth the whole week with this same nail. If one only had a handful of sifted oatmeal to put in, that would make it all right, he 
he said. But what one has to go without, it's no use thinking more about. And so he stirred the broth again. Well, I think I have a scrap of flour somewhere, said the old woman, and went out to fetch some. And it was both good and fine. The tramp began to put the flour into the broth and went on stirring, while the woman sat staring now at him and then at the pot, until her eyes nearly burst their sockets. This broth would be good enough for company, he said, putting in one handful of flour after another. If I only had a bit of salted beef and a few potatoes to put in it, it would be fit for gentlefolk, however particular they might be, he said. But what one has to go without, it's no use thinking more about. When the old woman really began to think it over, she thought she had some potatoes, and perhaps a bit of beef as well. And these she gave the tramp, who went on stirring, while she sat and stared as hard as ever. This will be grand enough for the best in the land, he said. Well, I never, and just fancy, all with a nail. He was really a wonderful man, that tramp. He could do more than drink a sup and turn the tankard up, he could. If one only had a little barley and a drop of milk, I could ask the king himself to have some of it, he said. For this is what he has every blessed evening. That I know, for I have been in service under the king's cook, he said. Dear me, ask the king to have some. Well, I never, exclaimed the woman, slapping her knees. She was quite awestruck at the tramp and his grand connections. But what one has to go without, it's no use thinking more about, said the tramp. And then she remembered she had a little barley, and as for milk, well, she wasn't quite out of that, she said, for her best cow had just calved, and then she went out to fetch both one and the other. The tramp went on stirring, and the woman sat staring one moment at him, and the next at the pot. Then all at once the tramp took out the nail. Now it's ready, and now we'll have a good feast, he said. But to this kind of soup the king and queen always take a dram or two, and one sandwich at least. And then they always have a cloth on the table when they eat, he said. But what one has to go without it's no use thinking more about. But by this time the old woman herself had begun to feel quite grand and fine, I can tell you. And if that was all that was wanted to make it just as the king had it, she thought it would be nice to have it exactly the same way for once, and to play at being king and queen with the tramp. She went straight to a cupboard and brought out the brandy bottle, dram glasses, butter, and cheese, smoked beef and veal, until at last the table looked as if it were decked out for company. Never in her life had the old woman had such a grand feast, and never had she tasted such broth, and just fancy, made only with a nail. She was in such a good and merry humor at having learned such an economical way of making broth that she did not know how to make enough of the tramp who had taught her such a useful thing. So they ate and drank, and drank and ate, until they both became tired and sleepy. The tramp was now going to lie down on the floor. But that would not do, thought the old woman. No, that is impossible. Such a grand person must have a bed to lie in, she said. He did not need much pressing. It's just like sweet Christmas time, he said, and a nicer woman I have never come across. Ah, well. Happy are they who meet with such good people, he said, and he laid down on the bed and went to sleep. The next morning when he awoke, the first thing he got was coffee and a dram. When he was going, the old woman gave him a bright dollar piece. And thanks, many thanks, for what you have taught me, she said. Now I shall live in comfort, since I have learned how to make broth with a nail. Well, it isn't very difficult if one has something good to add to it, said the tramp as he went his way. The woman stood at the door staring after him. Such nice people don't grow on every bush, she said. End of chapter 141 The Old Woman and the Tramp End of Tales of Laughter by Nora Archibald Smith and Kate Douglas Wiggin